as the tenor of their public conduct and preeminent services in the cause of all that can be dear to Englishmen. It is a sufficient reply to this jaundiced calumniator's insinuations. It is necessary for me to say anything more on the subject or dwell minutely upon the insinuations made by the author of the facts against some other highly esteemed characters had not the general nature of his publication added to the observation on the ladies of Longwood, together with the conduct actually adopted towards them at St. Helena, prepared the reader for still greater outrages upon female delicacy, I should have probably been led to enter into an examination of some of his calumnies. It is equally unnecessary to dilate on the manifest injustice and extreme impolicy of a writer who professes to defend the measures of administration, endeavoring by insinuations, the meaning of which cannot be mistaken to wound the feelings, not only of irreproachable and truly meritorious officers, but of their consorts. Had the author really felt, as he Jesuitically professes that there is a sacredness about the very name of an English woman, which makes it a kind of sacrilege to hold her up to public notice, even to meet with public approbation. It is likely he would have thus shamefully violated the doctrine laid down by himself and for no earthly cause than a line of conduct on the part of those who gave rise to his brutal censures, which every feeling heart in the empire will not fail to honor with applause. The authors giving the above fine sentiment as a reason for withholding many traits of female excellence is well worthy of the logic displayed in the other parts of his rhodomontane production, fully approving of the sentiments to which he has paid so little attention, I shall most assuredly not follow his example, even to relate some instances of females indulging feelings of that humanity to which the author of the facts is unquestionably a total stranger. In the note above alluded to, the author of the facts proceeds to relate some marks of attention stated by him as having been made to the wishes of Madame Bertrand with the view of proving that no improper animosity was kindled either in his Sir Husselow's breast or that of any of his family. I am fully aware that farces of this description have been frequently got up at Plantation House, which if the author was ever inclined to turn his Kekos's scribendi in that profitable direction might furnish him with some very useful hints. The writer forgot to inform his readers that these dramatic scenes were also exhibited at the very time Sir Hudson Lowe's restrictions had reduced the Countess Bertrand and her family to a state of the greatest distress when they had deprived her of society, prohibited the shopkeepers from giving her credit for a gown, and that her wearing apparel was subjected to inspection. At such a time, advantage was often taken of a favorable moment when passengers of rank on their way to England happened to be a plantation house. On these occasions, some of these individuals most interested in preventing the 12,000 per annum from passing it to other hands had recourse to a favorite maxim with hypocrites of every description of expressing the utmost sympathy and commiseration for the inmates of Logwood. Now is I really feel both respect and admiration for the lovely sex to which Lady Low belongs, I freely exonerate her leadership from participating in the deception or favoring the unworthy subterfuges of those around her. If therefore she was ever to say on such occasions as those I have mentioned, my dear, I hope you sent to inquire how Madame Bertrand was this morning. Can we do anything for her? Poor woman, how much she is to be pitied. It is, it must have been the pure emanation of a truly Christian spirit, not a premeditated effort to deceive for the purpose of aiding the torturous designs of others. In his notice of Count Dillis causes his last work, the author recurs to the affair of Count Bertrand and Lieutenant Colonel Eister.
this subject has, I trust, been satisfactorily elucidated in the preceding part of my remarks and with due submission to the author. It is one of those unhappy topics which every additional moting can only tend to render less honorable to the party whose cause he so vainly endeavors to defend the Count's observation relative to Sir Hudson Lowe's being a man who never thinks beyond the letter of his instructions is made the ground of acquittal in favor of the lieutenant general whereas everyone who has considered or taken any pains to ascertain the nature of his measures well knows that these expressions of countless causes apply to a particular case in which the governor had an ample plea for swerving from his instructions and that whenever any measures of coercion required a departure from them they were unhesitatingly abandoned as a proof of which i need only refer the readers to the count's statement so clearly explained in his letters not to mention the various other facts that have transpired relative to the transactions at St. Helena. Does this writer want to be informed that a man who adheres to the letter of his instructions in all that implies harshness and severity while he was never known to exceed them except for the purpose of increasing that harshness cannot claim the merit attributed to him on this occasion? On the contrary, such a mode of proceeding will doubtless be construed into a what of humanity on the one hand and a lamentable absence of talent on the other.